All right, hockey fans and hockey fanatics out there, welcome to episode two of the Hockey Lounge. I'm your host, Nick. If you want to become a lounge member, please hit that subscribe button below or follow us on Instagram, the Hockey Lounge. We have a beauty in the lounge tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this guest here. <laughs> Longtime friend, um, many road trips together watching football, hockey, hockey tournaments. Um, we played in the same organization in minor hockey. We coached for the same organization years back. We go a long way. So let me tell you a little bit of story about this beauty we got in the lounge tonight. I texted him about a week ago. I said, bud, I need an intro. I need a bio, um, you know, just something to introduce you to the viewers on the Wednesday night. And uh, I said, take your time, two, three hours a day, whatever it is to let me know how you want me to introduce you to the viewers. About an hour later, I'm cutting the grass, uh, chilling out, having a beverage. The phone dings. And then all of a sudden, the phone just dinged here. All of a sudden, <laughs> I get the text and bang. The intro, the bio, that would take me. It's a novel deep. It's, it's a novel. It would take me a week just to introduce him. I'd still be here next week for this gentleman. So he told me about his grade school awards, his high school awards, his employee of the month at Frizzani Locker Room Awards. He told me about even the first girl he dated, the first girl he kissed. But there's only one way to introduce this beauty tonight. He's a former OHL referee, former junior coach, longtime family friend. He is the one, the only, Mr. Paul Santi. Welcome to the lounge. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I guess you scraped the bottom of the barrel to have me tonight. So thanks so much. <laughs> I'm honored. I had to scrape hard, but you know what? You're at, you're at the top of the barrel. But okay, buddy. So we'll see. Paul has a wealth of hockey knowledge, hockey experience. Um, he's refed minor hockey, coached minor hockey. He's coached in, in junior. He's He had five seasons, I believe, in the OHL as a referee. Um, he even refereed against my team when I had the minor midgets back in the day and the midget team. But Nick, um, hold on. We don't referee yeah. against anybody. That's another thing. Oh, Trust me, oh, I don't referee against anybody. Well, well, well there's, <laughs> there's one thing that I promised I would never be, and that'd be a stripey. So <laughs> there you go. That, that's one thing, right? Um, but uh, yeah, we had the uh, Italian old dog on the show last week, Frankie boy. And, um, you know, we had Vic and they're part of my coaching staff as well. And I believed we threw in a couple F bombs at Paul while he refed us and we chirped yeah. him and he chirped us back, but that was fun. And, uh, so tonight, you know, the playoffs have started in, in leaf nation. Uh, it's like Christmas Eve. Everybody's waiting for the Leafs to play tomorrow night against the Montreal sure. Canadians. I wanted to bring Paul on because he's got a wealth of experience in coaching, refing and understanding, you know, the different elements of regular season play and playoffs. So Paul, you know, let the viewers know in terms of what, what you um, what you saw refing in in the OHL and you know some of the stars that you in the past or former or, or whatever they're they're in the NHL right now, um, especially the ones that are getting ready for the Leaf game tomorrow night. I know that we talked off air and and you you know you refed against a few of the Toronto Maple Leafs that are playing tomorrow night. So tell us a little bit about the O and 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 whatnot. Uh, I really enjoyed my time. I, I was a linesman, and I think that's a completely different dynamic than a ref, um, because the linesman, you really get to know the players. Um, and you also get to know, like, the shit disturbers, okay? Because yeah. that's your job. You got to keep yeah. the refs out of You got to keep the refs, like, as clean as possible. So you really get to know the guys that are that push the envelope, right? So, like, tons of encounters with, with Steve Downey, even though he's not playing anymore. But uh, he was, like, a big pest to, to manage. But if we go back to the Maple Leafs, and I told you at the start of the season, I really think – I'm not necessarily convinced they're going to win, but they're definitely coming out of the north. And I think it's primarily because of two guys I used to ref that were probably up in my top 10 players that I, ref, that I refed in the OHL, and it's Wayne Simmons and Zach Bogosian. So if we go back to when Zach Bogosian played in the Ontario Hockey League, he was part of that class of three defensemen that is it's never going to happen again in the Ontario Hockey League, I don't think, in my lifetime. So – it was Peter Angelo, Dowdy, and Bogosian. And because I was based in Toronto, I would get Peterborough, Belleville, Kingston, and there's only one linesman really further east than me. So I got a steady diet of Oshawa, Kingston, Bell, like on repeat, man, all the time. Like every Sunday night, I was in Oshawa. Chris DePiro became a very good friend. He's still a very good friend. He was the GM, the head coach of the Generals. 
-hmm. And I saw Johnny Tavares every single Saturday. And I think 15 years later, or every single Sunday night, I think 15 years later, he would still recognize me because I was there so often. <laughs> but going back to Bogosian, at that yeah. time, I thought he was by far the best of those three. I thought he was better than Doughty, and I thought he was better than Peter Angelo. And his career got off to a tough start in the National Hockey League because he got injured very frequently at the start. Um, but for the Leafs, that lack, the way that I personally feel the game is meant to be played, which is in the style of the Winnipeg Jets a couple years ago, the St. Louis Blues, the Columbus Blue Jackets played it very well last year. Carolina plays it very well, physical and fast. Um, I think Bogosian and Simmons were like two critical components to the to the pie. And I think Z Wayne Simmons is the most important guy in the Toronto Maple Leafs. Okay. okay so, so 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 we'll get back to Bogosian for a second. Yeah. yeah. So that being said, you know Bogosian got picked up here for the Leafs uh, this season. Uh, he won the cup in in Tampa last year. He was sort of, you know, he was put uh, unprotected on the waiver wire yeah. last year, picked up yeah. by Tampa. You know, what draft pick was he in the year? Do you do you remember for Zach Bogosian? He was he was he was definitely top ten. Top ten. I think, top 10. I think it went Doughty, Peter Angelo, and Bogosian, and Bogosian went to Atlanta. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect example of how luck is so critical for these guys. And people just think it's all about skill. Like that's my biggest pet peeve in all the hockey culture. Skill, 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 skill. Listen, skill is like baseline. Character, grit, determination. I'll use, I used to use this with, with the kids I used to coach, and I don't know if you can use it anymore in 2021, but you've <laughs> got to have balls the size of church bells to play this game, and that's the bottom line. You know what I mean? And Let, her, let them ring. Yeah, man. Yeah, but but, yeah. Th but that's the way like, – that's the way the game's got to be played – and those are the guys that have success, man, next level. And I think for Bogosian, he went to Atlanta. He broke his leg, like, I think, first or second season, which completely sidetracked his career. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have the tra trajectory that he that he that that I thought he was going to have, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Doughty's, Doughty's career thus far is it is what it is. He's Olymp Olympic medalist, Stanley Cup champion, the whole nine yards, right? And Peter Angelo, the same deal, right? And, and Peter Angelo, you know, like people ask me about Peter Angelo. I did his first game back from the National Hockey League. He did nine games in the National Hockey League. And it was against Peterborough, mm -hmm. in Peterborough. Mm -hmm. They won 5-3. Niagara beat Peterborough. He got three assists. And I am telling you, it was like he was on the ice with beer league guys. Like, I was sitting there saying, but this guy, like, this is a joke. Like, <laughs> like what's this guy doing here? Because, yeah. because he's not going to develop. This is a complete waste of time for this guy. Right. Because these these are like minor, minor midget AAA kids playing yeah. against a man. Yeah. Okay. And he exactly. set up three goals. And I think the goals were like all time. And I just remember if I, 15 years later, I remember like that particular game. And I just walked off the ice saying like, that was by far the most dominant performance I ever, I was ever on the ice for in, in the Ontario Hockey League. So Bogosian, uh, you reffed him many times over and over again. What were the attributes that really, you know, put him up there? You thinking that he was going to be, you know, a top three defenseman going into the NHL draft? You know what? You know what were his skill sets? Because um, now he's sort of like he's that sixth, fifth, sixth defenseman. Sure, he plays he's more older of that too, tough, right? Yeah, he's older, he's but older. he plays more of that tough role. Um, yeah. Was he as skilled back then? Oh. Was he a skilled defenseman? Nick, he was. He was running the. He was running the peeper, man, as a rookie. Right. Okay. He's okay. running the peeper as a rookie, man. Yeah. Like yeah. it was his show. Yeah. Like, and 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 I was like, and you and I have spoke, spoken about this at length. I'm really like anti-hockey Canada culture, right? I don't yeah. like that. I don't like the, the culture in hockey. That's why I'm not involved in any aspect. anymore. I don't even own a pair of skates anymore. <laughs> okay. And I thought he got the short end of the stick because he played in Peterborough where nobody, you know, nobody gives a shit. Like 2,000 fans there a night. Nobody cares about Peter Bro. Yeah, and he was American. And I really thought he, he, I really thought he got the short end of the stick because you had Doughty, Peter Angelo. They're getting all the hype. They played in the West. Um, not Peter Angelo, but uh, Doughty played in the West. He's with that Kitchener, London, Windsor, Sarnia, Sarnia. Yeah, like yeah, all yeah. those guys out there, right? I think Stammer was in the league as well at that time. So like, I just thought he was being overlooked because he was like an American guy. And like, I followed him probably more closely beca because. Like I guess you can say I, I was kind of wrong, but you know I he he's he's like six foot two, six foot. He's a big yeah. boy too, yeah. man, and he could yeah. play. So yeah. 
Um, and I saw him a lot. So that's ob obviously why I was biased as well. Like Drew Doughty, I thought he was fat and out of shape when I refereed him. I'm being honest with you. Yeah, I, think, I couldn't understand. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, what's everybody? Because I only saw Guelph maybe two times a year. So I was like, right. what's everybody in love with this guy for? And I was like, oh, Bogosian's way better. But but again, with Doughty, it was one of those things until he got into the NHL where he started training. Even his first few years of playing in the NHL, Doughty had that reputation of not wanting to lift a weight, being in good shape. Doughty is just raw skill. He's a talented hockey player. He's got good hockey IQ. Yeah. But, you know, looking at Wayne Simmons and Jonathan Tavares, you, yeah. you had mentioned to me offline here about a week ago that you said the integral part of the Toronto Maple Leafs making a run is – Wayne Simmons from Scarborough, Ontario. So why, yeah. why do you think Wayne Simmons is such an important piece for the Leafs' success this year in the playoffs? Because he's going to be able to accomplish the little things that you need to win. And those he'll, and, block, he'll, yeah. he'll, block, he'll block a shot with his mouth, yep. okay? If you need a big hit or you need somebody to defend, defend the players and they know they can't be pushed around. And like, so my brother-in-law, Brandon Berlon, we, we, we've, we've discussed in the past. Yep. Met him at training camp, okay? Because my brother-in-law was an Owen Sound prospect, and he'll tell you the story. He's like, "Who's this Wayne Simmons guy?" He's like, "He's like this." <laughs> they step on the ice, okay? They step on the ice, and because he sees him like a scrawn, mm -hmm. he's like, "This is not going to be a big collision." And he's like, "Paul, it was like I ran into a brick wall and put up a ton of points in the OHL." He fought. He killed penalties did all the little things that you need to win, you know? And I think that element for the Maple Leafs, while they've shorted up with Wayne Simmons, mm. Zach Bogosian, a little bit of grit, like Joe Thornton, okay. Yep. Spezza brings some leadership. But, like, that's why I've always maintained, you know, if you have a chance to pick John Tavares as your second-line center to Austin Matthews or Ryan O'Reilly, you take Ryan O'Reilly every single day. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we got into that discussion the other day, me and you, about, uh, you know – Tavares versus Riley O'Reilly. Um, now Wayne Simmons back in the O. Uh, did he uh, throw some knuckles as well, or was oh, yeah. he more of a yeah. finesse player? He played on a really, really good team in Owen Sound that always got beat by London, and they were like, they eventually ended up winning the Mem Cup when Bobby McNardi was playing for them as an overager, and I can't remember what year that was, and I don't think I was in the league anymore. But that that team Wayne Simmons played on, man, they had Trevor Lewis. Jeff Kierzakis, who was a, who was a hell of an OHLer, um, Bobby Ryan, who talent, and I've told yeah. you this before, yeah, pound for pound, talent wise, was the best player I was on the ice with, mm -hmm. uh, better than Johnny Terreras. Like Bobby Ryan blew me away, and I'm going to tell you why he blew me away. He was six foot two of like stainless steel, man. Okay, he could score, he could <laughs> score, and I remember a game in Barry where he's coming around the net. The defenseman went to go take him out, and he just ran him over, went around the net, put the puck in the back of the net. I'm like, this is insane. Like, this is – and I was just like, this guy is unbelievable. And he was taking <clears throat> number two to uh, Sidney Crosby. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's an example with, you know, some – not character, but just the, the – the, just the hardwiring of a human, how it's not all about talent, man. For know? sure. And, for, for sure. And so get a little bit of a, a – like it didn't – Bobby Ryan could – he scored 30 goals, I think, his first four years, right? So that's still legit, but probably not the way he wanted to finish off the way he's, way he's been the last couple of years. Yeah, we, we've talked many times about the grind of, you know, playing minor hockey, getting to that, you know, minor major level, um, yeah. going in the old draft, and then, you know, uh, it's another level. And then once you once you get drafted, you, you, you basically have to go through two more levels of – playing in the A and if you're one of those top picks, maybe you go right to the NHL. But, but that being said, let's go to JT, the captain of the Toronto yeah. Maple Leafs. Um, you know, I remember watching him too in junior and, and the knock on him was, you know, his foot speed and you saw it for firsthand, you were on the ice with him. Now, was that really a knock or was this just something that, you know, scouts were just saying because the kid had skill then too. He could, he has great hockey IQ, um, I love JT. I think he's a great leader. He just was lost in New York. Um, but what, what were your thoughts when you were refing against uh, or refing uh, JT? Yeah, um, I saw him a lot. Eh? I saw him a lot. Um, never a better set of hands and tight. Eh? Like the yeah. stuff, like the goals that I saw him score, um, like 
hash mark almost like crease in and what he's able to do with the puck is is out of this world the foot speed because of the hockey iq the foot speed he, he made up for the lack of foot speed okay um and he and he played with like not the greatest line mates like it wasn't a stacked house like the guys in london had or anything like that you know what i mean um but he was just he put in and he put in an honest an honest effort every single night yeah. and you just he, he had such hype that like you just expect him to put you know actually this is a good point you'd look at the end of the night and you'd be mm. like ah john Tavares had an okay game and he had four points right okay? so that's the kind of guy he was okay exactly my only thing with john is this Okay. He's a sweet, sweetheart gentleman, never gave me issues, in, intense guy, but a gentleman. The, it's not a knock against him. It's just the way he's hardwired. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's not hardwired like he's just not hardwired like some of those, like some of those other guys. And I've coached a ton of players like that that have like tremendous skill. They're tremendous kids, but they're just not like hardwired. You know, to step over their mother with skate blades on to, to block a shot. That's the example we used to use, right? There yeah. are guys that will step yeah. over their mother with sharp yeah. skates to make sure they get to make sure that they get the puck out of the end, right? You're bringing the one-liners tonight. We got uh, Adam Stevens here. I think he's going to start making T-shirts. He says, "Balls the size of church bells." We will use that in the room next year. Uh, so there you go. And he also said, "Bogosian went third overall in 2008." Um, we also have, you know, Teeps that's always in the lounge having a few beverages after five o'clock. Um, he said, finally, someone on the show that knows hockey. He always likes to chirp everybody. He's <laughs> saying Leafs in six. So that being said, Paul, um, Let's so talk JT, about Jack Campbell. Why don't we talk about Jack Campbell? Okay. We'll get to him in one second. So, you know, the one thing about Jonathan Tavares is I think he's a guy that just brings his lunchbox every game yeah, and just works. So right? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Three bags full, man. That's it. Right. So, and those are the guys that will get you to the promised land. If you build around them, you get Correct. the proper pieces like a Wayne Simmons. Um, before we get to Jack Campbell, right before we went live, we talked about Nick Felino, right? Yep. And you you have a smile on your face. Yeah. Uh, he plays the game right way, man. Played in Sudbury. Yeah. Um, got chirped a lot. Cause I think his dad was coaching for parts of his time there. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about like salt of the earth, 12 out of 10 human being. There he is. Mm. And he is the perfect type of guy uh, that they added because they need more guys like that. They don't, they don't need any more skill, like enough with the skill. You need guys that like are going to lay it, lay it down on the line, man. And that's the bottom line. And that's, and that's, and that's how the that's how you win. It doesn't matter what happens in the regular season. It's a completely different. It's a completely different game. It's refed completely differently. I don't even want to get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that. Nuts, we'll, right? we'll get into that. We'll get into that in a few minutes. But like, yeah. like Nick Felino play, and and his and his brother Marcus is kind of the same. I don't think his brother Marcus is good, but his brother Marcus is a big dude. Yeah, um, big body. And look at their dad, man. Like their dad had zero skill. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> And, and and Nick Nick was captain of Sudbury Wolves did a great job put up points man and uh, Listen, good for Mike, him Mike Felino had the one skill that no other hockey player had was that bucket he wore nobody yeah. can ever take that away from him yeah. and every time he scored he leaped and hit the ceiling of the of the arena so uh, Mike Felino um, he he brought it he brought it too though he was a character guy right when when I was I was doing a game in, in Peterborough okay yeah. <laughs> and I can't remember what happened. But he asked me like a rule question that was like a really basic rule question. Is this Mike Felino? Mike, yeah, Mike, the dad. Yeah, he yeah, coaching. yeah. He, he yeah, he was coach. He was coach. John, yeah, uh, yeah. Johnny Diversa played for him. Johnny Diversa was a defenseman for him. Jo Johnny and, and, D. Yeah, he played on they, our men's hockey yeah. team. Yeah, and they went to the they went to the OHL championship that year, and they lost to the best team I ever set foot on the ice with, the Plymouth Whalers. Yeah. Um, and he asked me a question. I looked at him and I said, "But Mike." Are you being serious? Or are you joking? He's like, no, no, I'm being serious. And I, that, and I went into the room. I said, guys, Felino just asked me this question. Is that not like completely offside? I used the National Hockey League rules a little bit different than the OHL. Just give him the benefit of the doubt. And I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh, so funny, I, man. I think Johnny D was our roommate back in Montreal when we went on a uh, a tournament there that just absolutely yeah. was a gong show ablaze in that yeah. weekend. But 
Um, there's one so, guy in the team showed up Friday. We didn't see him again till Sunday. <laughs> Remember that guy? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. We had one guy uh, every morning just waiting by for the bus to take us to the rink with uh, the uh, goalie mask on. Yeah, you know, licked yeah. out of his mind. But <laughs> good nights there, Thursday nights at Montreal. You know, good times. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that being said, the goaltending for the Leafs. This was a yeah. conversation we had last week in the lounge, and you know. You know, Frankie. What's up with the concern? What's up with the concern? Frank, Frankie, the old dog, uh, the Italian old dog, was saying, "You know what? We're good. We're good. Soupy Campbell's going to take us out of the north." Um, I know, like again, you're confident. So let's talk about Campbell. So, like, like a couple of things. So, like, it's 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 a lose lose, right? Because the narrative would be, well, Freddie Anderson, he's never won. Ba 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 ba. Right. And now you got Jack Campbell, who's got. Like, I don't know if people understand the pedigree that this guy had as a junior, right? So he's a University of Michigan commit, hmm. decommits to play for Windsor, which I don't want to get in trouble, but like Windsor, Kitchener, and London miraculously get all these American kids to decommit. I Maybe because they get like 10,000 fans a night every single night, and there's scalpers s selling tickets outside those yeah. barns. That's a conversation for another day. Could could have been could be some green passed along there. Yeah, it's probably guaranteed education money. So whether or not you go to school, you still your parents still get the check at the end of the day. But that's a conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. So Campbell comes U.S. U.S. National Development Team, decommits from Michigan, first round draft pick. Like the average NHL or the rook the rookie age, it may have changed because of salary cap, but. The, the skater, the average age is like 25. The goaltender, the average age was 27 when I was coaching like six, seven years ago. This guy's legit. And maybe he just hasn't had an opportunity to get the net. And now this is his opportunity. And he's done well. So I would base, I know about Jack Campbell and watching him come through the ranks. I have no hesitation at all, especially what he's done for them to get out of the North. I, I think they're going to have a very difficult time once they get outside of the North, but I think they're far better than they were last year. Um, and I think Jack Campbell's going to be okay. And I may be wrong, right? I may be completely wrong. I told you that Varlamov yeah. was going to take, take care of your boy Jari. And last night he let in that, like that muffin, man. Yeah. It, but again, it happens, you know, you look at, so, you know, for Leaf Nation out there. And again, like I said, it's Christmas Eve uh, for Leaf Nation and, and Campbell is starting tomorrow night against Price. Um, what happens if he, you know, he, uh, he pulls a sieve and do you take him out or you like, do you start Anderson the next game or, or do you ride? Cause listen, yeah, Anderson hasn't played much. He's been off his skates for what, you know, probably about a month and a little bit. Yeah. Got some, like, see, yeah. got some games in, in the, uh, in the a, I believe, or just, uh, sorry, uh, in the NHL a couple of times before the season ended last week. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's a tough it call. Depends. I think, yeah. It depends. Like, like there's that saying, like when, when I score a goal, there's not a picture of the goal goal I scored. Right. Like rust right. last night, there's not going to be a picture of that goal that he scored, yeah. which is garbage, but it still counts. So I think it also, like, there's also the eyeball test here. Right. Yeah, for like, sure. Like it depends. It depends how the game goes down. It depends if he does well. Yeah. Um, but listen, man, the guys earned the net End of story full stop, like cut the bullshit the conversations over let it, let's see what he can do. I have confidence in him because I know where he's come from and he's a highly touted guy, right? Even yeah. though the NHL is becoming a league of paying potential and not production, which is another issue. And that's the salary cap reason. That's a right. big, big thing. Cause we're, they're paying these 23 year old kids millions of dollars that haven't proven anything. And then you've got some really good vets, like a guy like Michael Delzato who can provide value, but mm -hmm. he's not getting the chance because all this money is tied up with these young guys because you gotta you you, you gotta lock them in for the long term. So right. Sorry to dig digress there, but yeah. That's... No, you you're right about that too. And 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 the teams are throwing around money to guys that are scoring 20 goals, you know, uh their first year, they're automatically getting a contract right. of four million plus. Right. You get your hands tied when you start right. doing that. Um, but yeah. you know, you look at Again, the Penguins last year um, against Montreal in the bubble. And, you know, um, that team there, the Penguins had, you know, somewhat of high expectations to beat them. And they lost basically because of one person. And, you know, and that's Carey Price. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm a Leaf fan tonight, the only thing I'm worried about is if he gets on his game, he can win you a series. Um, 
you know, so if it comes down to a goaltending duel, right? I don't <laughs> think the Habs have enough offense, Paul, to compete yeah, with compete with the Toronto Maple Leafs. But um, if Price does start to look like Carey Price, and he can, the Leafs might be in trouble if goaltending is not solid Fair enough. The same the same way Bennington can take that Colorado series, which if you if you watch that game the other night, he played like, great. Oh, right. yeah. unbelievable! The game right. should have been like five nothing. Right, and. For sure. You know, you can't. You can only control what you can control. The Leafs have a pretty dynamic offense, though, so I think I think it's going to be m- m- more challenging. And I think Montreal is easily the worst playoff team in the playoffs, like by a country mile, they're the worst playoff team. Um, so I think the Leafs should be okay. I, I I really think they should be okay, barring Carey I a Carey Price pulling like a Dominic Hasek, a Cam Ward, a Jaya Jaguar, like one of those yeah. historical Con Smythe performances. For sure, the Leafs should be okay. Like. If the Leafs lose because of Carey Price, it's not necessarily blow it up. You know what I mean? Like, like they, they they've done some good things to to uh, yeah to better to, their chances, right? To better their chances again. Veteran veteran leadership. You know, yeah. Joe Thornton, Wayne Simmons, these guys here. Yeah. Um, but again, looking at um, going back to your OHL refing days or yeah. being a linesman. Um, you know, if for listeners and viewers out there, the Kingston massacre. Yeah, um, that Man. that uh, craziest game of all time uh, that you that you lined. Um, yeah. You know, we were talking about that offline and maybe tell tell the viewers uh, a little bit about the Kingston massacre, because supposedly it's still known across the OHL and Kingston 100%. Yeah. and in the hockey everybody world. Knows. So everybody knows about yeah. it. So Kingston let's hear massacre, about the man. Kingston massacre. And what year was that? So Paul? It was either two thousand. It was December 30th, 100 percent, 2004 okay. or 2005. Mississauga Ice Dogs against Kingston Frontenacs in Kingston. And the only reason why I asked to do that game is because I was coaching the 94s um, in Ottawa, in the Ottawa tournament, and I wanted yeah. to do a game. And my mom and my dad came to Ottawa to spend Christmas because I was coaching there. Yeah. And that was the first and last game that my mother came to because of the complete disaster that happened that night. Okay. So it's <laughs> so Greg Gilbert, Greg Gilbert's coaching Mississauga, yeah. and uh, Jimmy Holton is coaching. Um, Kingston. It's a one goal game in the third period. Okay. Sorry, so is uh, is that when O'Sullivan was on the team? Like those guys there or no? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cody Bass. Cody, Cody Bass. Bass. Yeah, Cody yeah. Bass is part of the story. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Anthony Stewart, Corey Emerton, okay. who, was, who was a good player. Uh, this this six foot seven ogre Wallingford defenseman for uh, for Kingston who was like huge. Uh, and Bobby Bolt, Bobby Bolt's part of the story. He was a pretty rugged winger for Kingston. Kingston was always 500. Eh? They were kind of just like they could never ever just get over that hump. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Kingston. So this is my mom's first OHL game. My mom has no idea what the OHL is, right? So we drive together because we all went to Ottawa together, and now we're going to Kingston again. And my mom's like, you know, you're here so early. Like the kids aren't going to be here. I said, Ma, this is really isn't the kids. Like it's a little bit different. You're gonna have to get tickets to get in. So she had no idea, right? My dad was laughing, right? He's like, this is hilarious. So we go, we go do the game. Dave Kozel's reffing with me, longtime friend. Like the only reason why I was in the OHL, him, Mike Pierce, the only reason why I'm yeah, in the I know, OHL. I know those guys. Yeah. Those guys are okay. So, yep. so, so yep. I'm with Dave Kozel, Terry Hobart, and Al Detler. Mm-hmm. And Al Detler's been in the league for like 20 years. Okay. This is like my seventh game. Okay. <laughs> and it's a one goal game, third period. And Kingston is shorthanded, skating down the ice, two on two. Okay. And the play's coming towards me as the linesman. So it comes over the blue line, wave it off. Uh, the, the, the player carrying the puck for Kingston goes wide. Bobby Bolt and Pachesny, this defenseman, go to the net. Okay. Yeah. Kojo's hand goes up. So everybody in the rink is like interference on the defenseman yeah. all day long. Kingston goaltender takes off to the bench. See ya. He goes to the bench for the extra attacker. Puck squirts to the corner. As a linesman, you always want to, you don't want any crap after the whistle. I skate into the corner because Pachesny's going to touch the puck. Penalty is on him. Grab him off we go. He picks up the puck. No whistle. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking at Kojal saying like, what's going on? <laughs> Mississauga goalie. He takes off to the bench. <laughs> okay. So, the, so both both teams think there's a delayed penalty on both teams. There's no right? goaltenders on the ice. There was no goaltender on the ice. Okay. <laughs> to Chesney, tape the tape pass all the way down to the blue line to Cody Bass, puts it into the empty net. He snipes Goal. it. 
Go, go. <laughs> Terry Hobart skates up to me. Shanti, why don't you blow your whistle? I said, because I blew it last week, and a twenty-year, a twenty-year vet in the league told me if I ever blew it, blew a whistle on him again, he'd throw me out. I'd never skate another game in the OHL. He's like, "What's going on?" So we have to think. We go, Kozier, what happened? Well, the, the penalty was on on Kingston. It wasn't on Mississauga. So why don't you blow the whistle down? Well, they didn't touch the puck. Well, don't you think it was a good idea to blow the whistle? Anyways, so the Kingston player comes out of the penalty box, and the new guy goes in. So they're shorthanded for another two minutes. Okay, <laughs> so it's a tie game. It's a yeah. tie game. And we dropped the puck. Wallingford slew foots a guy. Match penalty at that time, automatic. Puck drops, match penalty. People started littering the ice. I had to hide in the net. And my dad says, my mom stood up and said, excuse me, the referees have mothers too. Stop throwing all that stuff. <laughs> so long story short, end of the game hits. They uh, Mississauga wins. They win 4-3 because they scored on the five-minute five peeper, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, the they got the empty net goal. Didn't that 100%, count? One hundred percent, buddy. One hundred percent, man. So, so yeah. buzzer goes five on five brawl. As they're brawling, people are throwing throwing shit at us on the ice. Okay, yeah. like I'm talking like pop bottles that are coming right out of the vending machine, not even open. They're hard like rocks. Yeah. So we clean up the five on five mess. I go into the hallway. My buddy Dave was almost in tears. Like yeah. Larry Mavity kicks in the door. I'm trying to build a new arena in this town. You guys are a joke. I'm like, shut up in the corner, towel on, just dying again. My mother is standing outside the door. The referee's people, door? Yeah. <laughs> Would you be quiet? Get going. Get going. Get going. Okay. We needed a cop escort out. Okay. My dad was like dying laughing the whole time. And Greg Gilbert walks in. Yeah. And he's like, boys, can I ask you a question? But why didn't you blow the whistle? <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> legendary man, awesome. legendary, awesome legendary story. story. So, so if you look it up, it's on YouTube. Like the brawl yeah. is on YouTube, yeah. and the commentators like, you can thank the referees for this one. So the next time I go to Kingston, Wayne and Al were the were the commentators. Yeah, I walk in. These guys were beauties. They used to bring us like six beers after the game, the whole nine yeah. yards. These guys were like twelve out of ten, and yeah. Wayne just passed away not too long ago. I walk in. He's wearing a mouth guard and a hockey helmet. He goes, Shanti, you're on the lines tonight? Got to have the hockey helmet and the mouth guard on. Because last time I got hit with three Coke bottles. <laughs> Nick, I'll never forget it, man. Hey, I'll never forget it. You're known, you're known for that, for sure, right? right? And then the other quick it. one that's like legendary is when Steve yeah. came back from winning the World Juniors. Yep. And uh, at the end of the first period in Brampton, um, I called an icing, and it was, it was a tight icing. Yeah. And he gave me the business because he was like really – like, I don't want to say arrogant, but he got a lot of pub after that World Juniors, and he was like king of the castle in the Sorry, OHL. You broke up there. What was who? Who are you talking about? The name? Steve Downey. Steve oh, Downey. Steve Downey. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah, after he came back. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's. This is the. Is this the Sportsnet uh, game of the yeah, week? Yeah, this is a Sportsnet game. Yeah. yeah, this is Sportsnet game of the week. Right in Brampton. Yeah. They're playing Brampton. So, so, so let's just go back there. So this is like it's on TV, prime time, Sportsnet yeah. OHL game of the week. Yeah. So this is a beauty story. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry for. So they off. just get back from. I think they they won right. Uh, the World Juniors and Peterborough was stacked that year. I think they went to the Mem Cup the last time they went to the Mem Cup. Uh, Dick Todd was coaching them, who was a gentleman, by the way, like 12 out of 10 gentlemen. And Jordan Stahl was on that team, who was one of my top three players I ever set step foot on the ice uh, with. And it's a tight icing. And like Downey was just so full of himself at that time because he thought he was invincible. Yeah. So he is gumming me the whole way down the ice, like giving me the business. Okay. Yeah. Let's get around. Period ends. We go to the room. Scott Hutcherson, who was one of my mentors in, in the OHL, and then he became a supervisor when I refereed junior A. We get in the room. He's like, Santi, what did he say to you? I said, you don't want to know what he said to me. Like, you just don't know what <laughs> you don't know. You don't know what he, what he said to me because yeah. I'm not getting involved because in that league, you've got to be very careful about like giving the stars penalties and all that kind of stuff. And I told, so I basically told him what he said. He's like, okay, I'll take care of it. No problem. We go for the start of the period. Downey's on the ice, taking the first face off, playing right wing. Mouth guards were a big deal at that time, right? Yeah. So we're about to drop the puck and Hachi's like, hey, Captain Canada, everybody in Canada watching you tonight again, hey, Captain Canada. And he's like, yeah, yeah, Hutch, why don't you have another donut? He's like, yeah, no problem, no problem. <laughs> Drops the puck, fires up his hand. Peterborough touched the puck. Downey, where's your mouth guard? Thank you. Ten minutes in the box. <laughs> Downey went like ballistic. You think they came to watch you, you fat blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Captain Canada, 
calm down 10 minutes in the box. And that was like, that was like one of the most priceless experiences, man, yeah, that you only yeah, get on the ice. I don't think yeah. anybody in the stands knew what was going on, but it was hilarious, man. It was those, Cody, those, Hodgson, Cody Hodgson was like dying laughing. Okay. Those are the dying stories laughing. that fans and fans and people that are watching it from home and, you know, just the chirps on the ice between, you know, the players, they banter, the coaches with referees, you know, that those are inside stories that, you know, fans don't get to hear. So yeah. some, some awesome stuff there. So let's go, let's go to your, um, your coaching days there where, you know, you, you coach for a long time in minor hockey and, um, you know, uh, I believe for the Richmond Oak Coyotes, yep. correct? Yeah. 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 Um, your 94 team, you said, was it 94, 98, 98, yeah, 94s, 94s. 90 yeah, 98, and then I coached the buzzers for 40, 45 games, and I and I stopped only because of work, because work just got to, just like the OHL. Yeah, you know, five years going to Sudbury. The first time is really cool. The second time is really cool. The seventeenth time, not so cool. So <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyways, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Coach so, 94, so coach ninety eight. Coach ninety four is coach ninety eight, and then and then into junior there. So. Your 94 team, I think, was uh, one of the better teams. A lot of championships throughout those years. Correct? 98. For the 98 team. Yeah, um, the 94s were okay, 94 lunch pail guys. Lunch, lunch pails, okay. So 98, <laughs> 98s, you had some players that, you know, uh, went different routes. So yeah. tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the difference between, you know, that next step of, you know, either you're going NCAA, you're going OHL. Yeah. Um, you had guys go different directions, yeah. both directions. So. Totally. You know the the difference in level, the difference of mindset. We always talk about it's between the ears. Um, yeah. You know, when I coached, and you know, we've had many laughs. I'm a, I'm a big believer, and for the guys that have coached with me in the in the past and present, you know, I always say, is is the bucket full or is it empty, right? Because if the bucket's empty, that player, even though he has skill, he probably won't go far. If it's full and he brings his lunchbox, he listens to his coach, he'll mm -hmm. probably have a decent chance of you know, making a little bit of a career for himself. So, for sure. you know, let's, let's talk about uh, that 98 team and mm -hmm. some of the guys you coached and, and the directions they went to. So we were really fortunate. We, we, we so let me preface this by saying, I, I, I coached my entire career with a gentleman by the name of Mike DePellegrin, who in my opinion is the best minor hockey coach has succeeded at every level coached in New York Simcoe coach guys like Robert Thomas, Alex Newhook, Quinton Byfield. Chris Tierney, um, and then came back to Richmond Hill primarily when I was involved because we just really meshed uh, very well because he's a very detail-oriented guy, and I'm I'm kind of like the the loud, outgoing, not very organized guy. Okay? Yeah, you're, you're, you're off the wall. I've, I've seen yeah. that, you right. know, just, to, just um, to tell everybody that, you know, I think I gave Paul his first part-time job. So um, the, just a quick story here on that before we get into a hockey story. And I told uh, um, my boys about this uh, the other day. Um, are you, are you, uh, did you mute your mic there, Paul? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're good. So this was, I think Paul's first shift that he, we worked at a, a store similar to like a foot locker or whatnot. And uh, you know, Paul and I, I've known Paul since, you know, he started walking and uh, you know, I wanted Paul to be part of my staff. So we, we had a, I, I was managing a, a small store and, and it was Paul's first shift. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, Paul, you ready to, to help out the customers on your own? Yep, Nick, I'm ready to go. I'm, 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 I'm ready to go. Okay. So I'm like, okay, there's your first customer. So it's a, a mom and daughter. They walk in and, you know, Paul gets out the Baranic device and, you know, he's fitting the daughter. He's doing everything that, you know, we've trained him to do. And he gets a couple of shoes and I'm like, Paul, you okay? You getting the shoes in the stock room? He's like, yeah, no problem, boss. I'm good. So five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by, 15 <laughs> minutes go by. I remember this, man. You I remember this? Yeah. <laughs> major. 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 Oh, a, how can I forget? <laughs> so so oh. 20, about 20 minutes go by. I look at the mom and daughter and, and you know, I was dealing with some other customers and I'm like, where is this guy? Right? Did he get lost in the stock room? I go back there, and there is a pyramid of shoe boxes. Like it was this high. There was shoe I, boxes. I was just going like this. That's not it. Everywhere. That's not it. Everywhere. That's not it. And we just finished. We just finished the week preparing that stock room. Yeah. And this guy just was tossing every shoe imaginable, trying to find the right size. It was. I'm telling you, those are one of my highlights 
of working for that yeah, company. There you go. That was that was awesome. We have a couple other stories, but yeah, we might say the last story at the end of this sure. uh, at the end of the yeah. show. But you know, um, going back to that '98 team and, and just yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, so, some of the guys. Yeah, yeah. So we took over a team, and as you know, Richmond Hill, you can't really recruit a lot of players because you lose so many to the uh, GTHL, right? So right. Uh, we took over a team that had parent coaches. They were struggling. <clears throat> they had lost. They got swept in the first round of play, and people just like mass exodus wanted to leave, and and that was fine because, um, I believe there's a minor there's a minor hockey culture problem in this country, and minor hockey should not be about winning and losing, and I think the pandemic is the greatest thing that could have happened to hockey, so kids don't have to play hockey games because we need to develop skill and we need to develop the mind, and when I was in the OHL, and I, we were talking about this before the show, okay? Yeah. My last season, I knew I was leaving the coach because I was really passionate about coaching. And I was like a sponge out there. And I would run across the hall to talk to Chris DiPiero after the game to pick his brain who was coaching Oshawa. Mm -hmm. And I would be like, you ran this power play. You ran this four check. Run me through a little bit of the strategy. And I really learned so much because I was, you know, I was really starting to like player evaluate instead of ref, right? Yep. I was calling off sides and icings on the side, but I was really <laughs> like evaluating <laughs> while I was on the ice. Yeah. And that... And based on my experience, right, and my love for the Plymouth team that won the OHL championship, I came back and I said, Mike, let's just play the game our way. Let's just get big, nasty guys, and let's just play super structured and build from the net out. And Mike agreed. He's like, structure is the way to go. So we took over a team that was like 12 and 17, uh, got swept in the first round of the playoffs. In minor Bantam, we won the London tournament. We were first place. <laughs> we were first place. Um with uh with one week left in the season in the eta okay yeah. and the reason why we had success is because we had non-eagle kids with non-eagle parents so our parents didn't question us they let us do whatever the hell we want yeah. and and that was the key and all of a sudden at the 98 age group everybody's like well who's this richmond hilton they're supposed to be garbage we were South central coyotes at the time they're supposed to be garbage and we went into the yeah. first round we lost to york simcoe in six games and then we started picking up kids from the gthl so um and one of those kids was a kid that was told he was not good enough to play AAA because he was six foot three, not skilled enough. Because in the GTHL, there's an obsession with skill and yeah. getting all the best kids on the two best teams and having them play 40 meaningless games and only having them play three meaningful games. Okay. So you right. don't develop any resiliency. You don't develop any grit. All you develop is entitlement. Okay. And, and if you take a, yeah, that's right. And if you take a look at that 98 team, which the best team was the Marlies. Mm -hmm. Take a look at how many kids are playing in the National Hockey League compared to some of the other teams that have kids playing in the National Hockey League. It's very, like, it, it, it's remarkable when you'll see, mm -hmm. um, like, Victor Mette never played for that team. He's playing in the National Hockey League. Any of the kids on, on, on those Marley teams, they're, they're not there. Mm -hmm. um, so we took this kid, and I think Kyle Thomas is a great example. He was like six foot, the kid was a, a bear, and he shot the puck like a pro. So we said, okay, come to Richmond Hill and play up and down the wing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three bags full. Stand in front of the net. And that's the bottom line. We took this little kid who's probably the best success story, Cam Wright, got cut from York Simcoe. We took him in Richmond Hill and we needed because we needed some skill because we had no skill. Right. Or very mm -hmm. little. We grabbed Cam Wright from York Simcoe, gets, gets cut from York Simcoe, comes to play for us. Pounded that kid down to the 10th line or the 10th forward because he wouldn't do what he was told. Okay. Yeah. And the kid would always come back to the top and basically say, coach, you want to put me as the 10th forward? I'll come back. Long story short, Kyle Thomas was our first line right winger or left winger. Cameron Wright was our first line in minor midget was our first line right winger. Kyle Thomas got drafted sixth round North Bay. Okay. He was okay. told in the GTHL he was no good. Yeah. How a kid that can skate that's six foot three and shoot the puck like a pro and isn't a, and, and, and will block shots with his mouth can't play. I don't know. Like maybe <laughs> that's a GTHL thing. You can yeah. play all day for, for Paul Santi. Yeah. Um, Cam Wright. Went to St. Mike's as a 16-year-old, fourth overall in the OJHL scoring, mm. first 20-goal score at Bowling Green in 15 years, Denver University grad transfer, and uh, he's going to be playing at Denver U next year. And he's going to—I'm telling you—he's going to play. He's going to play some level of pro because he, the desire is off the charts, man. It's completely right. off the charts. He does not like—you kick him in the mouth, he gets up. And his dad, like, this is a really good point. His dad couldn't stand us probably at times and hated us, but he didn't interfere. And his son would always respond. 
Well, the thing is, I think, you know, what we're hearing from your, from your experiences or whatnot is, is basically, you know, it's, it's will over skill a lot of the times. Right. Yeah. So, um, okay. So let's, let's get down to, we'll, we'll get down to a couple of topics here before, before we end the show tonight. Number one would be, you know, you ref in the O, you ref regular season games, you ref yeah. playoff games. We talked about this offline Sunday, yeah. you know, how the officiating in the NHL has totally did a 180 now. They're letting so many things go. So, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, when you ref in the O, uh, regular season playoffs and what you're seeing from the referees so far as of, uh, sorry, Saturday night when the Caps and Bruins started the 2021 playoffs here? Yeah, I struggle. I struggle with it because... <clears throat> I struggle with it because I think it's it's a little bit of a I think it's a little bit of a dinosaur mentality, right? Like I I just think you need to call the game the right way, man, and that's the bottom line. And it's not popular. And mm-hmm. you know, I never made it past junior A as a ref, and frankly, I quit because I was sick and tired of getting in trouble for for calling the game. Like I I didn't politic, okay? Yeah. And, I, and I'd like everybody to pay attention, you know, when there's a cheap penalty or a 50, 50 penalties called almost 99% of the time, unless there's an egregious foul on the same team, mm-hmm. there's some, there's some kind of like, and, I, and I'm passionate about this, so I'm going to swear, but there's some kind of bullshit call <laughs> to yeah. like, even up, even up the score. You know what I mean? And right. I just think there's like, it drives me nuts because like dinosaurs think that way, man. And the rules are the rules. And that's the bottom line. And if we call the rules the, sp- the way the, sp- the game is supposed to be played, the players are going to adjust. But, like, if you take a look at that hit, that's – who was it? The, Sa- the Sam, Bennett? Sam Bennett. Sam Bennett. On Coleman? Yes, it was Sam Bennett of the Panthers, yeah. Okay, so, uh, like, I'm going to give you – let me put you inside the mindset of, like, what a ref's thinking about. I'm yeah. telling you right now exactly what he's thinking because it, it, it's 100% true. He may not have seen the entire lead up, right? But the impact is still like way too aggressive. It's a boarding call all day. Right. You don't need to be an NHL ref to call it a boarding call. The guy's saying to himself, oh, it's a third period. Was it the third period? Um, I think it was. It, okay, second it or, third, it second or third period, yeah. It's yeah. a close game, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, if I call a major here, I'm going to become a factor in the game. So let me just call a minor – if I get in shit, so be it, and on we go. So the guy calls a minor, and then the guy's got a hearing. So obviously he made the wrong call. So right. obviously he made the wrong call. And that's the stuff in hockey culture that drives me nuts because there's this element of, like, you don't want to impact the game. How can you – what are you teaching kids when you see a guy like that take a run, decapitate the guy in the corner? It's not normal. Mm-hmm. And you've got to make the right call. And the right call wasn't made. And I don't give a shit if the guy gets suspended. I don't care anything. Yeah. The, the ref didn't have the stones to make the right call. And you know why he's doing it? Because he's scared shitless. Yeah, he doesn't want to impact the game. That's right. right. And he's not impacting the game. The guy, that just, the guy that just went 100 miles an hour from the blue line, he's the guy impacting the game. All right. We got some comments here from Ed TV 1054 Third period, Panthers were up 4-3. Tampa Bay tied it up on that power play, won it in overtime. Okay, so, so maybe the game doesn't go to overtime because they would have scored three goals on the peeper. How many How many goals on the peeper did they score that game? Every goal they scored was a peeper goal. <laughs> yeah, I got it for sure. So question for you. So Sam Bennett gets two-minute minor there, okay? Yeah. Has a hearing, gets suspended for one game. Yeah. Then you go back to that jabroni, Tom Wilson, Yeah. and the stuff he does prior to the end of the season with – Panarin and um, the other ranger there by cross checking him in the head. He doesn't have a hearing. He gets fined five thousand dollars. Sure. So, so if if you played in the NBA, they throw him out of the league. If you played in the NFL, they throw him out of the league. But right. in the hockey culture, it's like it's okay. It's not okay, man. Yeah. You know, and, it's and, not. It's it's not okay. And and like I said to you on uh, Sunday when we talked about the officiating, you know, it, it comes down to who's in charge of the disciplinary decisions here you have a goon you have an enforcer making these calls there is a committee but at the end of the day you have somebody that played on the line and over the line 
making these calls, making these suspensions, Paul. For me, it, it's you know not that you want to have a soft league, and but like you said, if you call the game the right way, the players will adjust. Soft, Nick. It's not no, soft, but the like, players like, will adjust it, to it. You've That's got what I'm to, saying. Like, there is nothing soft about hockey. So anybody that tells you um, that shouldn't have been a five minute ma five minute major, major and yeah. the league's soft. Yeah. That's bullshit, man. You no, know how I, hard it is to play this game? I agree. You know how tough I, you've got to be to play this game? I agree. And you made a valid point there because the NHL is the only – and listen, I love hockey. You know, this is why it's called the Hockey Lounge. But at, at the end of the day, you know, there is no other league out there that officiates different in the regular season and then – Maybe the NBA, different. Nikki. Maybe the NBA. Maybe, maybe the NBA. Maybe. maybe. Somewhat. Somewhat. But, but still, you're getting elbows when you're going in the lane or whatnot. Yeah. It's still not as bad as what the NHL no. does. Right? But like, you know what? I just want to share this quickly. Yeah. You know, David Branch needs to be commended because he 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 tried to nip this shit in the bud when I was in the league. Mm -hmm. And if we had if we had a if we had a situation like that, I'm telling you right now, because this happened to me three times on the way back in the car, okay? Yeah. We got phone calls from David Branch, Kingston Massacre. They got a phone call. I was going home with my parents to Ottawa. They got a phone call from Branch and Ted Baker on the way home. Yeah. And then I had two brutal hits. I can't remember who the guy who the guy was that did. I think Brian Soso um, or uh, Leambus, um, where he knocked the guy out. We got phone calls on the way home, man. Yeah. And Dave Branch tries to get that crap out of the game, and he's laid out heavy, 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 Suspense. heavy suspensions, right? Yeah. yeah. And he's throwing kids out of the league, right? That's even the way it's got to be. A hundred percent. But even going as far back as Jeff Kugel, remember that guy? Yeah. You don't remember when he fought yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. team? He yeah, threw yeah. him out of the league. Yeah. So. Yeah. It doesn't make it soft because you call the rules. Like that's like that's a dinosaur mindset. No, man. that that is the mindset again. But that's the mindset of these dinosaurs, and you'll probably see these gentlemen, uh, these dinosaurs probably leave the game. You know, it's, in a little while here. But, but that's the but mindset. that's why the playoff hockey the last three days has been the best I've ever seen. The pace is <laughs> yeah. unbelievable. Carolina, exactly. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Colorado, unbelievable. unbelievable. Right, for sure. Like play at that pace. Do you understand, buddy? Like yeah. it is un believable to play at that pace that those guys play at yeah playoff hockey best time of year so final question of the night for mr yeah. paul santi and it's been a pleasure having you in the lounge tonight um and i know that uh you know there's a there's a few beauties that uh love when i say the hockey lounge i just said it for them tonight um that being said uh the nhl playoffs yeah you know i like to ask everybody their their picks um, so I sent them to you. You sent them to me, but we want to hear them, right? Okay, so I'm not gonna through, I'm right? not gonna I'm not gonna read them off. You gotta say them. All right, so coming out of the north. Toronto Maple Leafs. Toronto Maple Leafs. Play against the Winnipeg Jets. Playing playing against the Winnipeg Jets, though, to come out of the north. Yeah. To, to yeah. come out of the north. But you have the Leafs coming out of the north. Yeah. All right. Then you have the East. Boston Bruins. Boston Bruins. Okay. And then you have the Islanders beating Pittsburgh. Oh, uh, you, you just want to say Nikki that. Tai. Yes, 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 Islanders you just, you, beating Pittsburgh, buddy. You just you just want to get only because of goaltending. Only because no, only because of goaltending. I, I those think, Islanders, man. It's gonna be tough to score against them, man. I, I think, and if your I, goaltender doesn't stop yeah. pucks like he did in game one, yes, okay. I agree. But I think okay. I think both goaltending is somewhat, you know. But you I know. just think Islanders have better goaltending. That's the only okay. reason why. And they play structure. And I think structure wins at the end of the day. I agree with you totally. Systems and structure, that's what I'm all about. You know that. You're about the same thing. So, yeah. um, okay. So, coming out of the East, though, who you picked the Bruins. You picked the yeah, Bruins. man. Okay. Yeah. So, we got the Leafs. We got the Bruins. Uh, coming out of the Central. Central. I think the team that – Central is Carolina, right? Yes, sir. Carolina. Then we have the Pacific Division. Colorado. Colorado. So we have Colorado, the Toronto Maple Leafs, Carolina, and the Boston Bruins. Yeah. We have the Minnesota Wild, Wild beating the Vegas Golden Knights. Okay. There's a little bit of an upset. Yeah. We have the Jets beating the Oilers. We have the Isles beating the – Como se llama there? The <laughs> Penguins. The Penguinos? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So – your Stanley Cup champion for 2021. 
from Mr. Paul Santi. I just need to ask you one question because I don't know who's playing against each other in the semifinals. Okay, so how this works is the teams with the okay, so the team with the most points will take the first place seed. The okay. team with the lowest points will be fourth, and okay. then second and third. So okay. uh, if you were to pick Colorado, Colorado yeah. would be your number one. Yeah. Uh, the Carolina least, two. The least would be four spot. Um, and well, then Colorado have, will crush the Leafs, but okay. So then, gonna crush so, so then you have Boston and Carolina. So Carolina. You, you, you have Tampa and, and the Leafs, and uh, you're saying, or sorry, you have Colorado and the Leafs. Yeah. So Colorado, oh, yeah, then you have uh, Carolina. There's Colorado has the best player in the world. Yeah, oh, here we go. That's for another night. We'll, we'll get into that. Best player um, in the world, buddy. Bar, best bar player. I'm sure there's a few McDavid fans out there that are. That are buddy, that. McDavid can't come close to what Nathan McKinnon does. Okay. Mc, Mc, <laughs> McDavid is the most skilled and talented and dynamic player in the world. But if I want to win a Stanley Cup, <laughs> Nathan McKinnon's the real deal. End of story. It's not even close, man. It's not even close. So, don't so, even... so, so we have fourth line plugs. So, Santi, you're a medzer. Yeah, that's fourth fine. Line, fourth line yeah. plugs. It's, yeah. it's starting. Here we go. Here we go. It's about that time. So, we have those four Colorado, teams. Colorado, Carolina, and flip yep. a coin. I, okay. I think Colorado. No, you can't, listen, you can't pull a Bobby Mack on me and say yeah, you're not okay. picking so, a winner. So. Okay, I am picking a winner. So Colorado, if they play Carolina, Colorado just because of the experience. Right. And uh, my favorite comment of the night, and he can comment on the hockey lounge anytime. Yeah, it's still Sid all day, pals. So thank you, Ed TV 1054 you are bang on with that comment. Fourth line panic. That's Eddie Verbanic, I think. Eh? Is it? Yeah, uh, I think so. Four, fourth line plugs. It's Vic. So uh, Vic uh, from last week's episode uh, is is chiming in here. Big Vic. He's coming up soon. We'll see him again very soon. Uh, so you're you're picking who to win the Stanley Cup, Paul? Colorado man. Colorado Avalanche. There's the pick from Mr. Paul Santi. Yeah, Paul. It's been a pleasure tonight. Thank you for coming to the lounge. Um, if you want to become a lounge member, remember, hit that subscribe button or follow us on Instagram, the Hockey Lounge. It is the best time of the year for hockey fans. Enjoy the playoff hockey. We will see you next week. There'll be two fan fanatics going at it. Everybody stay safe. Enjoy the playoff hockey. See you next week.